will now be recorded. Okay, I'd like to call the village board to order for Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. Roll call, please. President Kardoski. Here. Trustee Paul. Here. Trustee Zerbel. Here. Trustee Atkinson. Here. Trustee Krieger. Here. Trustee Flukey. Here. And Trustee Service. Here. Please stand for the pledge. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And please remember our men and women throughout the world in uniform. Um, I have no changes to the agenda. I need a motion to approve, please. Motion to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Action on the open and closed minutes from February 28, 2023. Uh, move to approve. Second. Motion and a second to approve those minutes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Number six, comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda. Must state your name and address. You're limited to five minutes. The board's role is to listen and not discuss the item. Personnel issues cannot be discussed nor individuals named and the board is not able to take action at this meeting. Is there anyone in the audience or online that would like to make a comment of items not on the agenda? Any comments not on the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move on. Number seven, written communications or announcements. I have none. Does anybody have any? Uh, yeah, I'd like to... Uh... Thank the uh, uh, road crew. And I got this compliment from a big uh, parcel post company. Uh, they got the big uh, blank trucks. And they said it's a pleasure driving through a Schwabenon through the snowfall that you people put up with, uh, <clears throat> I believe it was in, <coughs> excuse me, in February. Uh, they said it's a pleasure working in a Schwabenon and the roads are always clean when we get to other communities. It's nothing like this, so good for you guys. Yeah, uh, I did forget also though, um, we did have a, a great compliment on one of our um, staff that works in the water utility. Uh, we got an email from one of the residents that said he did a top notch job <coughs> and really enjoyed working with them. So I just wanted to mention that. They ne we never get those too often. It's always bad stuff that we, <laughs> we get calls on. So uh -huh. kudos to our staff. Mm -hmm. Okay, number eight, action on consent agenda, action on change of agent, CEC Entertainment Inc., DBA, Chuck E. Cheese, dash Lynn MC Carroll, B is action on change of agent for Quick Trip Inc., DBA, Quick Trip, number 1270, Adam Ehrenholtz, C, budgeted expenditures, D, February year-to-date general fund financial report, E, investment report, and F, department reports for March. If nobody wants anything pulled, I need a motion to place on file. Move motion. to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept and place on file. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Number nine, action items. 9A, authorization for village president to support the NFL draft bid for 2025 and 2027. Okay, Mr. Joel, would you like to kick this off, please? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam President. So in your packet tonight <clears throat> is a draft template letter that has been provided to us from uh, individuals from the organizing committee that is putting in applications for the NFL draft to occur uh, over a two period, um, well, two in individual applications for the draft to occur uh, in and around Lambeau Field for 2025 and 2027. Uh, in order for the organizing committee to submit a request or submit the application for the draft rather, uh, the organizing committee needs letters of support from the various uh, jurisdictions, governmental jurisdictions, indicating that they support the efforts of the organizing committee to hold the draft on, in those application years. 
as well as support the draft as it relates to resources that the municipality may provide or the local uni units of government may provide in support of the draft. And those types of things would be things like public works, um, traffic control, public safety uh, services such as law enforcement, EMS, fire protection, things of that nature. All the things that you would customarily provide every day to your citizens, but because of the influx of additional attendees participating in the draft, obviously there will be an increase in demand for services during those days and, <clears throat> and, and that period of time leading up to the draft. Uh, representatives from the Green Bay Packers are here to speak on behalf of the submission to the NFL draft. So I think Aaron Popke is available to come up and speak and, and provide a little bit more detail as it relates to the efforts that the organizing committee is creating in order to make those final applications. So I'll pass it over to Aaron. Does, do we need to open the floor? Move to open the floor, second. Se Motion and a second to open the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. The floor is yours. Aaron, please state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Aaron Pupke, uh, representing the Green Bay Packers, 1265 Lombardi Avenue. Okay, does Good anybody... see everyone. <laughs> Hello again. Yes. This is exciting, Aaron. Well, I may be able to speak. Do you want just kind of a general update? Sure. And can you answer a question? Absolutely. Sure. Excellent. Well, as uh, Joel aptly stated, we've got this effort to get the, the NFL draft in Green Bay. We have put in for the 2025 and the 2027 event. Uh, we feel really optimistic about our chances of, of getting one of those. And there's a, a lot of work that's going on, uh, as was mentioned here in the community. Uh, certainly with the Packers organization, we have a number of individuals that have been putting together the information the NFL requires. And then with uh, Discover Green Bay, Brad Toll and his team have been working to get uh, uh, hotels and event space, uh, the types of things that they often work with uh, for any event that comes to our community. And this, the draft is, is like, in many respects, uh, any large scale event that would come to a community just in a very large scale. Um, everything that goes into it, uh, we are excited and feel good about finishing touches we're putting on the bids, which are due this week with the NFL. Uh, we already have bids in from previous uh, submissions, uh, but what the NFL does, and this letter uh, that's uh, up for discussion is part of that. Each year they find out uh, more information on how uh, they can conduct the, the event in a more efficient, better way, uh, like like many events, they they have more detail that they ask for each year. So we end up updating the information we provide, and these letters are an example of that. Whereas previously it was more of a a general notion of support that government bodies would would put behind the event, uh, but this year we we've asked to to put it in uh, more specificity, and and that's what the letter is. But what we are doing is, is uh, getting our organizations uh, fully ready for it. The other thing we're doing is uh, working to get uh, financial support of the event through um, Green Bay, Brown County, Stadium, Professional Football Stadium District. And that board has expressed their support and even updated that yesterday at their meeting. Uh, the city of Green Bay has expressed similar support through the the same letters. Brown County has done the same with their letters. And now uh, we've got other entities that we are not in a position yet to uh, disclose in a formal way that are, are gonna support the bid uh, financially, local sponsors and partners, if you will. Uh, the Packers have pledged a million dollars uh, in the cash contribution that uh, will go into the budget to, to put on the event. That's in addition to all the space that we will be providing, as well as uh, resources from staff that have been putting time in on, on putting together all this information. So that's a, that's a high level uh, look and update at it, if you will, but uh, I can certainly how much, offer more. How much does it cost to put on the draft? Well, we're still working on that and we'll have a better sense uh, once. So if we're lucky enough to get selected, 
the NFL will come in and say, all right, you've given us a footprint of where you think it can go. Now we're gonna come in and, and detail that and then we'll have a better idea of exactly everything that'll go in. But we're, rough estimate is somewhere between six and seven million right now. And of course, so we've got inflationary pressures on some of those uh, estimates currently too. And the, the types of costs that go into that are the, the footprint itself. So there's some staging and other um, items that'll come in. Um, the, then the main stage itself has to be erected, uh, tents and, and other areas of, of the event. Um, not unlike any other festivals we go to, but just in a very large scale. The security that'll be in place around it, and that's and we're talking about hired security, third party security, like once that perimeter gets set up, the campus gets set up, so there's uh, security that'll be in place throughout the load in and the, uh, and the breakdown of the event afterward. And then of course, during the days of the event itself, uh, we are doing some extensive shuttling uh, just with uh, uh, the amount of people that we expect will, will pass through uh, north of 200,000 people over the course of three days. So we'll have offsite parking and of course have to shuttle people in. So there's a significant cost in, in shuttling and various events you've been associated with. That's, that's something just at a very large scale. Uh, we will have a, a core of volunteers that is gonna come in and work the event along with paid staff. Uh, but we're gonna have uniforms for everyone. We'll, we'll feed people. So if you think of all the costs that go into those things over the course of, a, well, it's a three day event, but a, but a multiple week build up too. So there's significant costs and that's where it can add up to the extent that I mentioned earlier. So is the actual physical draft gonna take place at the Expo Center, is that the thought at this point? And then some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the campus- the stage in the- well, <laughs> or, or where, where, where are you thinking that would be held? Well, as, as I mentioned, the NFL will ultimately decide how they want to lay it out. Gotcha. But what we've proposed is, and where it's, how it's been laid out in previous locations has varied. In Dallas, their stage was inside their stadium. Yeah. And we think that would be a very fine option here. Right. Um, those of you who remember the kickoff concert after our Super Bowl, the stage was erected at the corner of uh, Armed Forces Drive and, and Oneida Street. You know, that could be something they decide to do too. It's, I mean, it's got a great backdrop. Um, you know, they've done all sorts of things in the other cities. So roughly we think the footprint will be uh, Holmgren, mm -hmm. uh, west to say Marley. You got Lombardi on the north. And then, uh, the, you know, the couple of different streets that come along the other side stadium and, and McCarthy way. So that could be a rough footprint and they could put their stage anywhere within that. But we think the, the places I mentioned make a lot of sense. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, how come uh, 2026 is skipped? What's the... The Packers have committed to hosting a large scale event, one event each year, whether it be a, a concert, a soccer match or a college football game. And that's when the rescheduled that's Notre Dame, Wisconsin game is. That explains it. Yep. I was just wondering that's why. That's 26. Okay. okay. You, uh, the pandemic uh, got that one uh, shifted. How no. much uh, revenue does a draft bring to the community that's hosting it? Well, uh, Brad Toll and I and, and his team, Joel Eberts, uh, we've been looking at this using the calculators that, that they use uh, for such events and going off of information from uh, Cleveland recently. Um, we think that's somewhat analogous to the setup we'll have uh, this year. It's in Kansas City. In fact, uh, myself and a team from the Packers will be heading there along with uh, Brad and some of his team members. Uh, and we've been doing this for a few years now. So it's it's not quite apples to apples. Or if we compare it to Las Vegas last year, it's it's a little different setup. But um, with the uh, the input of, of some previous drafts, we think the total Total, est uh, total estimated economic impact for the entire state is uh, right around $90 million. So that, that's really stretching to Milwaukee and, and the Fox Valley and west probably to Wausau, just where people will be staying. I mean, they'll come to the state, the hotel certainly will fill up here like a game weekend 
and then the concentric circles outward into other hotels. But that's the total impact we think to the state. And then uh, certainly a lot of that will be focused right here in Brown County, tens of millions here as well. I think our latest number was around 18 or 20 right here in, in uh, Brown County. So it's, it's like a game weekend and then some. Mm -hmm. And as uh, uh, Brad and his team can speak to this much more uh, uh, effectively, but it's, it's essentially a three-day commercial for the area. <laughs> if, if you follow the NFL, if you've looked at the drafts, it's, I mean, it's all focused on the draft, but there are the pieces that get shown about the community. And we feel we have such a unique setting here that we know we'll get a lot of great imagery of, of Greater Green Bay and the surrounding area. Aaron, is there any uh, numbers of people that would come to an event like this? Do you have any projection on that? Yeah, the, the previous drafts have been uh, certainly a couple hundred thousand minimum uh, between Chicago and Nashville and, and Dallas and Las Vegas. There's been numbers, but we feel about 240,000 is a good number for the, the three days of the event. Certainly, I think Thursday you get your your biggest push Thursday, uh, Thursday, Friday, and then it'll tail off a little bit on Saturday. Okay. But we think that that's a pretty, pretty good estimate as to what we'll see. Because what we've seen, certainly we know with football games, uh, we draw from all over the state. Uh, we saw with the soccer match last summer, uh, you know, we drew from all 50 states, but we know we'll get certainly a lot of out of towners and then people from across the state that'll drive in and make a day of it in addition to those that, that'll fill the hotel rooms for the whole weekend. Okay. And the, the other thing I should mention with uh, Brad and the value of the draft, the three-day commercial that we described it as, but, but Brad and his team talk about how having that event here allows them for years before it and afterward to just talk about Green Bay host of the NFL draft. So it's a, it's a pretty good calling card that they can use for other events for years into the future. Um, maybe Aaron and maybe Joel could answer this. Um, this um, letter would commit the village to doing what we typically would do with other events coming in, the public safety, public works, that type of thing. So that's really what that's committing us to at this point. Um, are you are they looking, are you looking for any funding at this point or is that something in the future or is the village committing to any funding with this particular letter for the event to support it? Well, I'll, I'll attempt to try to answer it first and then Aaron can correct me where I'm wrong, but <laughs> at this point, no direct commitment or funding to the, to the draft submission as far as hard dollars go at this time. Um, I'm sure if they were look, going out and doing a, a strict fundraiser, there could be a potential ask in the future, but that has not been presented to us yet. Uh, but we do know that there will be expenses that the village will born out of hosting the draft, and we recognize that. We know that over a three-day period, we're going to anticipate it being very similar to a Packer game day. We're just going to be three successive Packer game days over uh, over that span. There's obviously the buildup and the takedown, of course, too, but certainly not as labor-intensive. Um, we anticipate that cost, obviously, uh, being offset by the additional room tax revenues that would come in as a result of the extended stays as well. So uh, we will, because we have so many months, if not years, in advance of when this draft would take place, we should have sufficient time to plan and appropriately budget for that and recognize that there will be offsetting revenues to help accommodate those additional costs. Okay. Thank you. I know in, in talking too with Brad Toll that um, don't they want like 4,000 rooms committed? And so that will greatly, greatly increase our room tax. So. Yeah, Brad and his team have put together that manifest and it, it starts literally a month out with X amount of rooms for the first week and then it just grows each week as more and more people come in to prepare for it. So is that working? group that'll uh, descend upon the city. So we, we've got a minimum number of rooms that the league and the support team needs uh, to have, to be able to come in and set up. And then all the rooms outside of that will get filled up by attendees. I, I do want to add though too, I don't, I don't want to be remiss on this topic that three Packer game days successive in, in, in a row does put a 
pretty particular strain on our existing staffing. Obviously, it will impact other service areas that we may have. So there will be a need for us to work and partner with our neighboring jurisdictions, whether it's the city of Green Bay, Brown County, <coughs> our neighboring jurisdictions, as far down as the Fox Valley, or, Fox Valley or beyond, to also ask for additional support and resources. So our officers, that, that's quite a burden on them to accommodate for over that three-day period. So we're gonna need to bring in officers, maybe from other jurisdictions, to assist in that effort. And I presume that's going to be the case for both the city of Green, Green Bay and Brown County as well, that there'll be a concerted effort amongst all of the local jurisdictions to bring in outside resources to help support and supplement the staffing that we currently have. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? No, okay, I'll- I think it's exciting. I'm gonna move to authorize the village president to execute letters of support to the 2025 and 2027 draft local organizing committee. I will second, second that. It. Okay, we have a motion and a second to authorize the village president to support the NFL draft bid for 2025 and 2027. Any other concerns, thoughts, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimous. Thank you. And now I, I do need a motion to close the floor. Move to close the floor. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Yes, Aaron. Yeah. I suppose I can't say thank you. So yes, it's you not can. Closed, but, <laughs> but thank you for the opportunity to, to visit, and, and we'll be speaking more about uh, this event. We, we feel, as I said, very optimistic about it, so we'll see. Aaron, we appreciate everybody's support. What's the next move on it? The big move for finding out. Yeah. Big move for funding? No, no, for Fine. finding out if you're going oh, to get finding it. out. Sorry. Um, so there's meetings going on right now. It's not part of those meetings, but there's a spring meeting in May where we very well could could get an update then. So we we certainly know 25 will be awarded this spring yet. As far as 26 and 27, not not certain. They've done it both ways in recent years, but we know we'll find out about 25 for sure. How do they give you a year plus time in preparing? Yes. So we'll so we'll hear 23 is going on now. Uh, 24 is in uh, Detroit, and then 25 will be hopefully here. But we'll find out. So we will know, yay or nay, this spring. And if it's a yay, then it's full speed ahead and all the things that we've been talking about. And if it's a nay, we we feel really good that our chances are there for 27. So we'll continue our efforts. Do you have a preference? Uh, no, I, I think we'd be, we'd be thrilled to get it either way. It'll be a big lift for everyone involved, whether they know it or not, people will be involved, but that's all in a good way. It, it'll be the largest event this, this community will ever have. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it'll be a lot of work, but it'll be a lot of fun and it'll be lasting impact. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Thanks again. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, 9B, action on appeal of denied operator's license, Nicholas Stanger. Chris. In the packet, you'll see that um, there's the denial letter, the original application, and the letter from Nicholas Stanger. Uh, he did not appear at the Public Works and Protection uh, Committee meeting. I did send him a reminder of the meeting today, and I don't see him again. Um, He's not attending. in the audience right now? No. All right, if not, I'll move to approve the deny. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to deny the operator's license for Nicholas Stanger. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 9C, action on Class A beer slash Class A liquor cider only request for Packerland Express LLC DBA Jaguar Shell. Mary, yes. I'm going to recuse myself from any discussion or action on this item. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris? So this um, Jaguar Shell is the um, convenience gas station on the corner of Cormier and Ridge, and um, they are asking for the same type of license that was there before, and they are in the audience if you have any questions. 
Okay, uh, this was approved at Public Works and Protection. We didn't see any problem with it, so I'll move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the li Class A beer, Class A liquor, cider only for Packerland Express LLC, DBA Jaguar Shell. Any other comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> motion carried. Thank you. 9D, action on Class B beer slash Class B liquor license combo. Exception request for District Poorhouse LLC, DBA District Poorhouse LLC. Chris. So they are asking for um, the Class B beer, Class B liquor. Uh, in state statutes, there's an exception um, for uh, a restaurant that has permanent seating of 300. Um, so it doesn't count against our quota, which as everyone knows, we don't, we don't have any left of our quota. They're all gone. Um, so, um, that's what they're going for and everything, um, is paid for. All the paperwork is filed. And I don't know, Joel, if you were going to talk any more about this. I don't necessarily need to. This item obviously was presented to Public Works and Protection Committee this month. They did provide a recommended vote for approval on it. It was not a unanimous vote, however. It was a 4-1 vote. Um, prior to uh, the Public Works and Protection Committee, just as a kind of a general notation or reminder for the board, uh, obviously Tyler and his team have applied for this similar license, Class B beer, Class B liquor combo license in the past, to which point the Village Board did deny that uh, application, but did provide guidance to Tyler and his team that they um, meet with staff and devise a plan to present back to the board in a new application uh, that addresses issues that were identified during the prior committee and board meetings, predominantly related to uh, the fact that um, there was limited information as it related to food service and the aspect of a full service restaurant, as well as concerns, uh, at least from a staff's perspective, uh, in interpreting the board's comments related to the safety and security and the dispensing of alcohol within the establishment. Uh, Tyler and his team did meet with staff prior to the formal resubmittal of an application. Uh, staff included our village clerk, Chris Teske, public safety chief, Brian Ewell, myself, attorney Patrick Legal, and community development director, Aaron Schutte. Uh, we did advise Tyler and his team some of the components that we felt were necessary uh, to resubmit the application. Uh, some of those components related to an expanded menu, a revised floor plan showing the permanent seating um, so that he can meet this and satisfy the the um, requirements for the exemption on the 300 seat restaurant facility as well as communicate and discuss with us provisions that he has in place to ensure the proper dispensing and not the over dispensing of alcohol to customers in his establishment. Uh, Tyler did present his information to, as I mentioned, to Public Works and Protection at this last month's meeting uh, and Tyler and his team are here as well to address any questions that the board might have. So with that, I'll pass it over to the board and answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Does anybody have questions or do you want to have discussion or would you like to open the floor? Well, the only comment I have, uh, we kick this around quite a bit at Public Works and Protection. Uh, they com they're coming up with a unique idea on food. Uh, we're willing to uh, take a look at that. Uh, it's a little different than a full-blown kitchen per se at a uh, restaurant that you're all aware of throughout our village here. Um, I'll leave that one alone. Uh, we're, we're comfortable with that uh, and seeing something new. You know, we, we're, let's keep our eyes open and not uh, uh, be blinder, have blinders on and not let something like that happen. It might be a new way of uh, serving food. I don't know, we'll find out. The only problem I got, you got to hold the 300 uh, permanent seats as uh, our clerk mentioned. You're going to get a rush of people on an event day, and don't tell me you're not going to move them tables around to pack in that place full of people when you can hold 500 people in that building. You're going to be watched on that, and if it does not have that 300 permanent seating, 
you're going to be in trouble. We're going to, um, me being on the Public Works Committee, uh, I'm telling you that because that happens to be the area that I represent. And let me tell you, I don't mind a cold beer looking around sometimes. <laughs> so I might be a spy in the sky for you. I agree with you, Gary. That's one of the questions, concerns I had about this license is the 300 people permanent seating. And I did ask our attorney to look into that. And my understanding, and Patrick, please correct me and please make this clear, um, is that they have to have 300 permanent seating in there. They can't take in and out for events and activities. Is that correct? Correct. <clears throat> so minimum 300 seats. So right. my understanding is that you have 400 permanent seats in the, in the facility. Maybe you could re remove them to fit, let's say, a band on the stage, for example. If there's a minimum 300 permanent seats in the main area, the main restaurant, where your primary uh, principal business is still operating a restaurant with 300 seats, you'd still be um, abiding by the statute. So that'd be fine. But right, permanent seats doesn't necessarily mean um, take down tables and chairs and put them to the side on occasional events at night, turning it into a dance club, for example, or something like that. Packer games come around, there's no take stacking chairs and putting to the side permanent seats, meeting permanent seats. So the, the, the intent of the, the statute was um, <clears throat> not to have small bars, um, ha like have picnic tables and exterior seating in the summers and qualifying for this restaurant exemption. It is specifically for uh, municipalities like the village who have, um, are, have met their quota, don't have any more to give, but there's still businesses here that want to operate a restaurant, restaurant being primary and the alcohol being secondary, which is what 300 seats on the restaurant is. So again, permanent seating is permanent seating. Mm -hmm. So if you, know, if you look at your site plan, and everyone got it in their packet, um, there are 300 spots on there, with, but there's like close to 36 of them that are on the stage. So if you ever have a band, you're already below the permanent 300 seating in that facility. So they're already in violation of that to even have a band, because obviously you can't have the band playing between all the people sitting on the stage. Um, and I had asked Aaron about it with the building and the um, fire code and building code. If there's enough room in here to have that much seating, and he explained it needs to go, and Aaron, you can maybe explain it better. Um, it needs to go to the state for review to make sure they're meeting those codes as well. You know, like Gary said, you get, you look at how tight this is, and it may be deceiving because I have a very small plan here. Um, but my concern is the, the seating needs to be permanent, and there's not a heck of a lot of room in there for people to stand when I look at it. And because there's almost 40 of them on the stage, we don't have 300 seating in there right now with this approval. So it doesn't meet the criteria set forth by the state statutes or state law, I guess that you would say, or whatever you, how you would explain it. But Aaron, maybe you can address the building part of it, how that would be handled. Sure. Uh, so from a, what'll happen is uh, as part of the, uh, redevelopment of the building is uh, it will go to for state plan review and as part of the state plan review they will evaluate the building uh, as in terms of egress uh, for emergency purposes occupancy uh, maximum number of occupants all within the confines or constructs of the state code um, so that is something that they will take a look at uh, if there are any issues it'll be addressed at that point um, one thing to keep in mind is that this is an 8,000 square foot building which surprised me a little bit when I did the math. It is that large. Um, so off the cuff, you know, I, from an occupancy standpoint, I don't necessarily see an issue, but again, that will be reviewed uh, through the uh, state plan review process. So, you know, that's, you have the state plan review, which is like the chicken before the egg kind of thing, which do you do first? So I understand that they don't want to go to state plan and I get that until they get a license. Um, but my whole thing with it, if the state is saying you can't have this um, because it doesn't meet code, I think we need to be contingent on that and also make sure that they have 300 permanent seating in if, there and that meets the state If code. that's the case, they wouldn't be able to open. I know. So it's like, it, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I feel like you just move forward. Like Gary said, we beat this up a lot at Public Works. We went over this over and over. It's different. It's new. It's not something Absolutely. we're accustomed to. Right. 
right. which I applaud you about yeah. trying different things. And um, so I, I, I've, I've, I'm on the side of that. I, I feel we should move forward with it. But I, you know, if obviously the state says no, it's not going to work. Well, then it doesn't matter. It's not going to work. Okay. So I don't feel that it's uh, that it's necessary. And correct me if I'm wrong, Patrick, on that. But no. if the state would say sorry, then it doesn't matter. We approve the liquor license because right. they can't open anyway. Right. Um, so and, and just speaking with our with Chris, our clerk, they, we wouldn't grant the liquor license without occupancy. It is. It would be conditioned on that certainly. Right. Um, now, with with Aaron mentioned the E plan, if there was discussion with the with the reviewers that. Um, Okay, well, maybe in the stage area, for example, or in the corner area, if some of the tables can be moved or adjusted around according to the plan reviewers, could it still meet code, um, even though we take some of the tables down or move them to still make the minimum 300 um, seat requirement? Um, that could be still reviewed um, and, and, and approved by the plan reviewer and still meeting their, their exemption requirements. So it's not necessarily saying if we take the the tables and the chairs off the stage, they don't qualify. It's what happens if we do. So if they decided to one to put a band on the stage where their tables are right now under the plan, and we move those tables down on the floor, and we put them in certain areas, plan reviewers will obviously review that. And if they approve that, they're still meeting, meeting this 300 permanent seating requirement. It's not necessarily taking them off right now. So as proposed right now, assuming it passes the plan review, then we would we could grant it as is, but um, right. It's just ma making sure that it's up to code while also having that those 300 seats, regardless of where the tables and chairs are, as long as they're permanent. That's the requirement. So, uh, if the tables are, are moved and it still meets the egress and the fire code, everything like that, then they're still complying by the statute. So, in other words, what you're saying is that if they don't meet the E plan code, they wouldn't get the license anyway because right. they wouldn't they would get occupancy. Right. Now correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, it's not just the plan review, but there's some other items that the inspection department might review as well. So that combined would get the certificate of occupancy and then clerk's office would issued after that. That's exactly right. Um, so it'll go through state plan review uh, through our e-plan uh, exam consultants. Uh, they'll review it uh, based upon state plan, uh, state code requirements. And then during construction, our inspectors will be going uh, in and out of the building uh, at requested times to review the review the plans and make sure that the construction is consistent with those plans and with the state code. And if all is said and done, uh, they finish up inconsistent consistent with the plan, issue occupancy at that point, they would be eligible to obtain a liquor license. If at some point they just can't finish, uh, can't uh, complete construction or can't complete construction in a way that meets code, then they would not be granted occupancy and therefore could not be granted the liquor license. So you, know, you can talk all you want about codes and regulations and state checked and village checked and county checked and whatever. My question is on this all is who is going to check it when it's in operation? Mm -hmm. It's like any other code or ordinance we got in this village, you can have all you want, but who's checking them? And it's only done on complaint as we are operating with a half-time code enforcement, which I hope we get a full-time one real <laughs> shortly. Uh, that's my only question. Who is going to check it when it's in operation? Yeah, let me, uh, I, I can maybe address some of that. So some of the, I think, questions come up as, as it relates to the exemption. So the quota exception or exemption, if you will. Um, we, it is my understanding that we have the ability to purchase additional reserve licenses. We have, I believe, two additional reserve licenses available to purchase from the village of Hobart that would not necessarily equate to the exemption or exception requirement of 300 seats. So the 300 seat is not a condition of granting the license. However, it could be a decision-making factor for if the board grants the license because maybe you uh, desire to grant the license so long as it doesn't take away another available reserve license, right? So we do have licenses available to issue outside of the requirement of the 300 seats. 
So I do want to make that clear for the board. So you do have that dis discretion to make that decision. So that's number one. To answer your question, Gary, it, it would be like no any other enforcement matter as it relates to the licensing. So we could certainly actively enforce it. Our public safety officers could go in and verify that the license is properly placed, the premise is being properly enforced, the seat, 300 seat could be, we could have a code enforcement officer do all of that. We don't presently do that actively right now with any other establishment unless we get an active complaint against that establishment for us to verify. Now, with that being said, statutes also provide an opportunity to, opportunity for any citizen, anyone to file a written complaint against that establishment to the, to the village, to which point the village may institute a revocation hearing then at that point or suspension hearing to review the licensing to make sure that the conditions of the licensing has been met. So if an aggrieved person went in there and, and wanted to file a complaint because maybe there's a noise issue or some other issue, they can issue a complaint in writing to the, to the governing body, to which point the governing body then can go through a uh, quasi-judicial process and uh, hold that revocation hearing. So it doesn't necessarily require village staff or paid staff to issue a complaint and initiate that suspension or revocation process. That can come from anyone um, that files that written complaint. Understanding, but this is something new. And that's why I'm concerned about the startup. Can can I ask the um, Taylor? Has Tyler? Is that correct? Okay. Can I ask them a question or not? We can open the floor. Motion to open the floor. Second. Motion and a second to open the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Could you come up and state your name and address for the record, can please? I say one thing or not? Yeah. So, Trustee Paul, there's also the Department of Revenue. Um, those agents are around, and they um, they check on those things too. Oh, they are out and about. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. okay. Well, that answers a little bit of security. Okay. Uh, we'll April look. Smith, 460 South here on Road Green Bay. Tyler Smith, 460 South here on Road in Green Bay. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, April and Tyler. Um, the question I have for you is. Did you, when you were going through this whole thing with staff and going through it, did you understand the 300 seating and that you couldn't totally move it out and have an event? Or was that something you, you were assuming in your business plan that you could have a band and take half the tables out and do it? Now, and is that clear to you, I guess, at this point? Right now, that's very clear. And that, would, that actually became very clear to us when we met with um, several members of the Village of Ashwabanon. Um, prior to our last public works meeting. It was laid out in very good detail to us. We know, ex we know exactly what was requested of us and therefore we went back to our builder and made that request of them to make sure that they could accommodate us in that premise for that 8,000 square foot building. Oh, and, so you, and, and I think, I think according to the, to the drawing, if you look at the drawing, it's a drawing. You know, it's having right. having set set all those in there and visualize that on a drawing is hard to do. Taking those ones off the stage and putting them around in the, in that space, that's something that in eight thousand square feet that we can do. Anyway, we wouldn't you probably need them on the stage. You know, we're we're just representing what we know we can do and we can do better. So having the requirement that you keep three hundred seating in there at all times does not jeopardize your building or your business plan that you had and what you intended to do with the facility. You it does you feel you can do what you need to do and be successful and meet these guidelines and standards of the 300 seating and permanent and the restaurant part of it and the 51% food sales and all of that to qualify for this license. You feel comfortable with that and you're you understand all of that. Yes. Thank you. You know, these people have been here for, I think it's the third time yeah. if I'm counting right. Uh, they worked with the staff, I know that. I've talked to the staff a little bit about it. Um, it's a new concept, you know, and I think that's why we're so concerned about it. And the number 300 is uh, 
that's a significant number to be packing into that yep. warehouse, which it is right now. Uh, they've always met the demands that the uh, staff has put on them. So I think uh, I don't have a problem on okaying this. Uh, we got to give them a chance. They're spending a whole lot more money than they thought they were from the start, I know. Uh, but they didn't run away from it. Uh, so I th that's my comment. It'll go up for a vote after. But uh, I think what they're proposing, and they know the rules and regulations, and I know seating is an issue. Uh, it's a big building. I know that. I know what it looks like. But uh, let's hope they can meet all these challenges and be successful. I... Uh uh, twice I was down in, in Texas in the last month, and there was a couple places really? like this <laughs> that were really well run. I didn't know what to ex expect out of them. Um, they were very um, very casual and very uh, relaxing places. Uh, so as far as the, the self poor thing, um, it's, it seemed to operate real well, and, and the security there was, was out of the way, but they were there. Um, so I don't necessarily have a problem with, with that part of it. Something new, it's kind of exciting, like, mm -hmm. like Jay said. I, you know, I commend you on going after that. Um, I feel better Aaron's comments about the space provided. Um, but I hear a lot of people up here mentioning bands, but I never heard it from you guys. <laughs> Was that your intention, or is that your intention to have entertainment there? Yes, we do, we do have the stage there to have bands accordingly, or even just like... Um, Duets, like two people, music okay, on the yeah. stage, like that too. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I'm pretty confident you guys get it. You know what, yeah. what everybody's hammering about up here. I agree. I've been to the one in Duluth, and it's a really fun concept. It's a fun place. I think it, it's one setup that could handle that many people, because you're all going up to get your own beverages. Uh, I think the New Age Kitchen is. Great idea. Um, I don't know. Do I have to move to close the floor before I can move to approve this license? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If everybody's done asking questions of Tyler and Amber, yes. I'll make a motion to close the floor. Sorry. Second. Motion and a second to close the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Sorry, I called you Amber. You, April. April. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Thank you, guys. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then I would move to approve the Class B beer, Class B liquor license combination for the district poorhouse. I'll second it. Okay, so is that the Class B beer, Class B liquor combo exception yes. request? Mm -hmm. Okay. But Un under that's discussion. where I'm at. I'm sorry. Yeah. Under discussion, um, so I want to make it clear that includes permanent seating for 300. That includes that their business is primarily a restaurant. And also that 51% of their revenue will be from food sales. Is that correct? That's what's required of the exemption license. It's not required to have that 51% threshold. Um, that is an ordinance that's being proposed in a later agenda item, but okay. that's not technically in the books right now. Okay. So the, um, the requirement is that they run a full service restaurant, right? According to how the board, the board's wishes and their application at the 300 permanent seating. So, right, essentially running it as they made the application, correct? And that with this approval or with this motion, if E plan finds something that they, the occupancy doesn't doesn't allow it for occupancy reasons, then this license will not be up, or will not go through. Correct. Correct. Chris, is that what you're saying? So how I would like it, you know, stated is that the board will grant, and I won't issue until I get the occupancy permit okayed from Aaron. How about the motion um, be made to motion to approve the um, class uh, B combination license for the exception license for the poorhouse condition on the occupancy certificate of occupancy being granted? Okay, you're okay with that? Trustee I'll, Service. I'll accept that friendly amendment. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll second that friendly amendment. Okay. Everybody understands this. Uh, one quick question. The uh, out door area is fenced off, I believe, so people stay inside there for drinking. 
What are you doing for, and I know you've got exit, exit doors and overhead doors going out to the parking lot. Are they going to be closed so that they're not wandering around off the property? Right. The only way they can get in and out is through the main, you know, they, they, you've got exit doors for emergency purposes. I understand that. But as far as getting out of that corralled area, they're not out rousing around in the parking lot. All right. All right. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Does everybody understand? Any more questions, comments, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carried with one no. Okay, 9E, action on special event application for the summer fun days showcase at Title Town. Chris. Okay, so village staff um, had a meeting to discuss this event. Uh, it's now ready to present to you guys. Um, due to the special uh, event policy that was approved by the village board, um, because they're, they wanna close Southridge Road at Lombardi Avenue to Mike Ovinger Way, um, we need the board's approval. And um, they are here in attendance to speak. If if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, the only question I have, are the people within that immediate area of traffic notified of this? The major, well, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say the majority of that is um, land that's owned at Titletown by the Packers. And I did try to contact um, a person who has an establishment over there. Are we thinking of the same person? Probably, I'm sure. I, I think oh. I had four oh, yeah. calls. All right, all right, because so. I know that's gonna be brought up. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Gary, to, to also clarify too, as part of the special event policy, the or, event organizers do need to provide notification to areas of impact, uh, and they need to provide two notices. So one pending the approval tonight will go out relatively soon indicating that this is the date, so plan and prepare, and then an, a second event notice would go out a couple weeks in advance of the actual event so that they are aware that there are gonna be traffic impacts and closures. The village has in the past provided the organizers the list of addresses that the information should be sent to. Um, I believe in this particular one, we've gone um, all the way from Argonne basically to, to Ridge, and I'm forgetting and somebody helped me out on the southern east-west road that it connects to is at Marvell. I think we've gone all the way down to Marvell. Marvell, you Marvell were, uh, and Morris. It was at Marvell and Morris. Morris. Yeah. And so there's a quite a bit of an area that we send labels to to provide notification because right. there's there's amplified music obviously associated with this. So beyond just the traffic impacts, there are other mm -hmm. impacts to the neighborhood. Right. The, the, the people that are going to be impacted, are they going to you know, the businesses, I should say, are they going to uh, get some uh, impact from this uh, event? They'll I get mean, are they going to be generating some money from this event? I would assume so. The organizers, I believe, had estimated around 40,000 people in attendance. So those immediate businesses in and around the area and beyond, uh, kind of in that greater stadium district, okay. are all going to benefit from this okay, event. As long as, as long as they're benefiting, that, that'll hopefully answer some of my questions <laughs> from the phone calls. And you know, the one, the one item too that, um, the one person that I tried to get a hold of does have access into their parking lot from the backside. So, it's not like it's being totally shut oh, off. Well, I so, realize that, yeah. Anyway. Uh, actually, I will contact him. Okay, we have representatives of the Packers here to um, answer any questions. If not, I'll entertain a motion. Is this a first time event or have you guys run this before? Okay, I need to make a motion okay. to open the floor. Second. second. Motion and a second to open the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Could you state your name and address for the record, please, Jackie? Hi, I'm Jackie Krutz, 1065 Lombardi Ave. And I'm Jessica Dickett, uh, 1065 Lombardi Avenue. Okay. Pull the speakers up so we can hear you. Or the microphones. There you go. Okay. So is this a first time event? I was looking through your application, I couldn't see it in there. 
So the event has been hosted probably for four years, but in terms of an, an event this size, last year was a first. Okay. So when you've had about 40,000 people and that's what you're basing on this year? It's last year we had about 30 to 32,000 people, so we're estimating an increase this year. It does look like a fun event, by the way. <laughs> it is. And the time is from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. is what you're looking at? So the event itself starts at 3 o'clock. The main stage, which is um, the feature of the event, uh, it's a well-recognized musician. So last year was Jason Derulo. This year will be in the same caliber. Um, he sets to take the stage at 8.30. Okay. But we have other activations that take place starting at 3 o'clock. But it ends at 10 p.m.? Correct. Okay. Okay. The concert. Okay. Okay. I got no other questions. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, I need a motion to close the floor. Motion to close the floor. Second. Motion and a second to close the floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll entertain a motion. All right, I'll make a motion to uh, the special event application for the Summer Fun Days Showcase at Titletown. I will second that. We have a motion and a second to approve the special event application for the Summer Fun Days Showcase at Titletown. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you very much. Uh, 9F, action on 2023 ash tree removal bids. Tim. <laughs> um, 2023 is the, marks the, the start of the third year of our five year Emerald Ash Borer Management Plan. Um, years 21 and 22 focusing on the east side of US 41 as well as many of our park sites within that area. In 2023, we'll be focusing primarily on the west side of US 41. Um, essentially, street trees will be located from Park Place area all the way south across 172 into um, the Orchid Avondale neighborhoods. And the project area is, is shown on, on the map in your agenda item. The bids were sent out to approximately 30 different contractors um, within the area and throughout the, the eastern part of the state. Three separate projects were identified as a priority for this year um, based upon the action plan that we approved several years ago. Street trees will be removed in management areas 6 through 11, 375 in total. Um, so that will be the areas from Park Place all the way down into Orchid Avondale. So that will be project area A and it will include the stump grinding. Project B is two park sites, uh, Gillis Park, there's a handful of ash left there, and then uh, Pioneer Park, which we have um, a number of ash trees. I think there's approximately 45 or 50 there. And then the third project is, is kind of a, a unique situation. Um, that project has, it, it's challenges um, due to the location of the trees, the wires that are there, a drainage way that exists. Um, it's the Dutchman's Creek Corridor, which is located between Buffalo um, from Kimberly to Shady Lane. Um, kind of a unique area. It's, it's nice that we put trees in there, but now we got to get them out, and there's all kinds of challenges in there. Um, I actually had a contractor. I uh, wanted to know if they could use a helicopter for that job. I said, well, <laughs> if it comes within budget, I, I guess we, we would entertain that, but um, we didn't get a bid from them. Um, and then in, in that Dutchman Creek project, there's 20 trees um, from Kimberly going west to Shady Lane. And then on the west side of Shady Lane, we own a, a small section of property, um, part of that same corridor, and there's um, approximately 21 ash trees within there. Um, they're close to people's sheds and fences, and we, we don't want that material ending up in the creek, um, blocking flow um, somewhere down the road. So I've identified that. As long as we're in the other area of Dutchman's Creek, we'll skip across the road and grab that. Um, we received bids, and they were open last Monday. We received bids from seven contractors. Um, 
You don't have to bid on all three projects to get awarded a single project. And the reason for that is you know, the more contractors we get involved in this, um, we're not the only community dealing with this, so these guys have work in other places as well. Um, the recommendation um, is going to be to go with the low bidder on all three projects. Um, Foley's tree service for project A and C. Um, Foley's, I've worked with both of the contractors previously. Foley's did the Argonne Park job um, in December of 2021. Um, they were great to work with. They're very responsive to concerns. Um, they did a great job, cleaned up very well. And then um, Foley's Tree Service did um, the street tree removal, or um, I'm sorry, um, Trios Tree Service did the street tree removal contract previously, um, and they were low bid on the, on the park work for this job. Um, once again, they were responsive to the concerns that were generated as we worked through that project, and um, I'd be happy to work with them again. Tim, you're comfortable with these people you were saying? Yes. Okay, I've kind of listened in on the park board meeting and it was quite a lengthy discussion on this. So to shorten this up, I move to approve the bid as presented. Second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve the award of bid A to Foley's Tree Service for 145944 Bid B to Trio's Tree Service in the amount of 16199 and the award of bid C to Foley's Tree Service for 25306 Everybody understand? Any concerns, thoughts, comments? Uh, one question, <clears throat> Tim, when is the notifications gonna go out to the residents? Because that's something that I know, like on Orchid Avenue, that's gonna be a devastation. Um, when does that happen? Everything's ready to go. So as soon as we have a contractor on board, they give me a project timeline we're ready to go with that information. Okay. Can I ask that not only do we contact them directly, but we make sure we get it in our publications and things like that, so as much as we can push out, because that these neighborhoods, I don't want these people to be surprised. It's not like they don't know it's coming. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. But I certainly want to really communicate them when it's gonna happen. Yeah, and we've got um, direct mailings ready to go to each individual property owner that's that's affected. Um, the Dutchman's Creek, I'll probably send a general letter to anybody that borders that area, yeah. um, just so everybody knows what's going on. Perfect, yeah. okay, thank you. Just a quick comment. So it's my understanding these bids, they have to do the job that they said they're gonna do for that amount of money. You, if they like are in the process and encounter a problem, they just have to eat it and finish the job and we pay them exactly what we said. Is that right? Correct. Because some of those bids were like $50,000 yeah. less than other bids. I'm like, what happens if they get in there and they're like, whoops, we didn't bid this right? Well, both of these contractors have done work, similar work for the village previously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was noticing Great. some and of them didn't want the work too bad. Well, the variability is, is some of these contracts are, they called me and said, Tim, I'm swamped. I got enough work you know, for X amount of months or whatever. He says, I'm gonna put a bid in on it just because, you know, we sent them the information and if they're oh, low bid, okay. we'd certainly go with them. But yeah, a couple of these guys are pretty busy. Gotcha. Tim, that publication that you're sending out, I know you do a good job on that, but does that also include if they wanna, are they gonna have the choice of buying a tree to replace the tree they're taking out or how is this taken care of? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we do have money budgeted within the project funding to provide replacement trees at no charge for the residents that choose to have a tree planted. Okay, so they have to contact you for that? No, we'll reach out to them. Oh, you'll go to them? Yep. Okay, okay. Because yep. I know that's always a question that uh, I've seen before, so. Yeah. All right, you And that'll be a separate operation. We need to get the trees down first, and then yeah. we'll look at getting replanting done. Okay, all right. Were there any trees that need to be removed in the conservancy off of North Road by Gerhardt running back in there that are potentially going to fall and block up the waterway right there as well? Yes, there are. And that will be a future project area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Does everybody understand? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 9G, action on Ashwabame deck rebuild recommendation. Rex. All right. As a number of you know, we had some issues with the uh, upper level observation deck at Ashwabame Lake last year. Uh, we've got it shored up uh, right now, but that really is temporary. So we're looking at rebuilding uh, in a very similar fashion, uh, minus a, a little bit better support system. Um, although this one did last 40, 45 years, 47 years, I think. So that we got certainly got our money's worth out of that one. But um, we asked Somerville Architects um, to design us a, uh, a very similar deck on the A-frame at Ashwabame Lake. Uh, what you have before you in your packet is an engineered drawing of how that deck would be constructed. Again, very similar to what we have, except some of the railings now would be galvanized versus wood, uh, just longer lasting. Um, we received three quotes uh, on the project. Um, one of the quotes is under the $25,000 threshold, um, which you have before you with the, with the different uh, Companies that bid, um, that's going to be RJM Construction. So uh, staff recommendation is to go with RJM Construction on rebuilding the Ashwabame Lake Deck. This would come out of the, the building fund, so, you know, which is good, really good for all the, all the village buildings. Questions? This did go to Park Board and, and uh, RJM was approved to, to uh, recommend to Village Board. Uh, Rex, listening to your park board meeting, this thing has been beat up from left to right. You, uh, you've got a good project going there, and I think the uh, engineers did a good job on explaining how it was going to be built. So I'll move to approve this project as you're presenting it. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the deck rebuild with RJM construction in the amount of $24,896. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. 9H, Ridge and Valley View Pavement Marking. Brian Rickard, this all has right. been a nightmare, Brian. Yeah, I, I know it has. Um, <laughs> not only have Steve and I and other members from staff received calls about this, but it's my understanding that some of the elected officials also uh, received some feedback. Some? <laughs> Should I say all? <laughs> um, anyways, so as, as you may or may not be aware, uh, when you're going down Ridge Road, uh, southbound, right near Valley View, uh, essentially there's, there was uh, early on before the pavement marking was installed, two through lanes. Uh, at what point in time when it got south, uh, Valley View, it did drop to a single lane, a single through lane. Um, so what essentially occurred uh, is there was pavement marking installed in the fall of last year that made the left, the left lane a left turn only lane and the right lane closest to the curb line a through or right turn lane. Um, with that, uh, there was some uh, concerns expressed uh, from residents within the village along with um, some discussion that we had with public safety. Uh, during our traffic committee meeting that uh, there would be interest in potentially looking at providing a reconfiguration of what the lanes are. Uh, that reconfiguration would make the right lane a right turn only lane. The left lane would be a through lane and a left turn lane. Um, some of the benefits to that would be is there, there is a fence uh, right near the restaurant establishment in the northeast corner of Valley View and Ridge. Um, that's kind of blocking the vision triangle. So if you are at that intersection, you're trying to look to see for a car that is coming through that intersection to the left, uh, it does somewhat obstruct your view. So pushing that car more towards the center line of the road uh, would assist in um, being able to see that car uh, when it were, were to be coming. Um, so with that, uh, we're, we did have recommendation uh, to have the existing traffic pattern changed, uh, as I had stated, uh, making the right lane a right turn only lane. Uh, so essentially there would need to be some re-signing that would need to occur, um, some pavement marking that would need to be ground off, some pavement marking that would need to be reinstalled. Um, and then with that, uh, of course, we'd probably have to put up some additional flagging and stuff like that to ensure that people are aware uh, of the change in lane configurations. 
So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you may have. Well, I tell you, we came back from a meeting down south. We drove down Ridge Road and looked at that, and it was like, what in the heck is somebody thinking here? Because it was nothing but a hazard. Even today, I go down the road knowing I should stay in the right, and I'm in the left lane. I mean, it only makes sense that the road goes straight and the traffic goes straight without veering off the curb when you get on the uh, south side of that intersection. So I think your plan here is the way it should have been and it should be now. So I'm gonna move to approve this project ASAP. Okay, second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any comments? Uh, yes, under discussion. Um, this was put in in the fall of last year. And my understanding talking to Joel when this was decided to be put in, we had a traffic engineer look at it for the village of Eshwabanon, and the traffic engineer came back with two designs and said, either one would be fine. You have your pick. Talking to Joel, it sounds like no one really knows who decided you know, why the one was picked that was picked, but it was approved by a traffic engineer. And we put money into having a traffic engineer design this. We also paid to have Century Fence put the paint down. There's a cost to all of that. And now we're gonna take it all off. We're gonna repaint it and have a cost to do that again. Are we gonna have another traffic engineer look at it? Because I do not have the ability and I don't think the public has the ability or maybe any of us up here to say, this is the right design versus that's the right design. We're not traffic engineers. And my concern is any change is tough for people. And I, I get that. But there was no notice of this happening. I was out on, I went on a um, public safety, I went with the ride along, and the officer I was riding with, we were riding up there, and all of a sudden he goes, oh crap. And he didn't know anything about that being there. And we quick switched over to the other lane. Um, the public wasn't noticed. There was not any additional signage to warn people that there was a change in the road design. When we typically put up stop signs, we'll put yellow signs on our flags, you know, kind of noticing people, hey, this is a new stop sign here. And none of that was done. It was done like overnight. All of a sudden, like, like Gary said, all of a sudden I went up there and I'm like, what the heck? And I had people asking me about it as well. But my concern is it's getting better. People seem to understand it and you don't see as many issues with it. And I would like to know what the expense was for us to initially put it in and then what it's gonna cost for us to redo it all, and we're gonna have that learning curve again, you guys. And does it make more sense? And I understand the obstruction, Gary, you know, with the fence. That's in the visual, that's in the vision triangle. Can that be moved out of there? Can we work with that property owner and say, hey, move this thing back, and let's give this a little bit of a chance to see if this is gonna work. Um, I just hate to see us, you know, starting all over, and then the public and us making a decision, this other one is much better, when we had a traffic engineer do it and there was a decision made to go that route. So that's my concern with, with the whole thing. And I would ask Joel if you, know, if you had a chance to check the costs on that, if you could relay that to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly can. So, uh, and I'll, I'll touch on some of the, the history behind the project too, because I, I don't know that we necessarily got into those details here tonight. But um, my understanding in talking with Brian uh, today, um, essentially what, what we had back uh, several years ago, I think this dates back almost three, four years now, um, that the village engaged heirs and associates, a, a specific traffic engineer for heirs, to look at several intersections throughout the village, this being one of them, the Ridge and Valley View. Argon Street was another one. I think there were a couple others on the list of things that we wanted them to review and come up with a recommendation for traffic delineation at those intersections. So to get to the point here, it was about six hours of their staff time uh, at their billable rate of $150. So we probably spent about $1,000 in traffic analysis of labor, staff time, uh, not our staff time, but our consultant, uh, so billable hours. And then the installation of the pavement marking and the signage uh, was approximately $4,100. Uh, obviously, converting that back, there are some savings because some of the current markings that are that were installed can be saved and used for the redelineated intersection. Um, but some additional signage obviously would have to be purchased and replaced. 
So there is a cost to switch back and forth, and that was one of the predominant reasons why we felt that this was important to bring before committee and board, that we made a decision, this decision was made, whomever made it, it was implemented, and now if we desire to go back, that, that's fine, we can do that, but there's a cost. And is the board okay with uh, assuming that additional cost to do that? To give you some background or context to this conversation, um, based on the information that was presented to me, at some point there was a conversation at the internal staff traffic committee meeting about concerns related to enforceability of, of incidents that occur at that intersection because lanes were not properly <coughs> delineated for who has right of way. So if a car is entering into the intersections from Valley View and there is a car moving southbound on Ridge Road and there's a crash, does who has the right of way, right? Obviously the car that was at the stop condition did not, but if that person, let's say, had their right turn signal on or something like that, there was, there was just some general concern about the enforceability if the lanes were left undelineated. So there was a request to have a traffic engineer review the intersection and come up with a recommendation for how both the, the left or the right uh, southbound lane should be delineated. The traffic engineer came back and said that both the options that, that we're discussing were viable options. So the current condition that is present today was identified as a viable option by the traffic engineer. The proposal to change back to, if you will, is also a, an eligible option from the traffic engineer's standpoint. Both options would work because they clearly delineate and demarc what lane is that preferred travel. I don't know this definitively. Obviously, we've had some staff turnover, both in public safety and certainly within public works. Why that decision was made to make the right lane the through lane and the left lane the turn only lane, I assume it was predominantly because of the condition that occurs on Packer game day, where that left lane becomes a uh, defined left turn only mm -hmm. lane. So I, I assume that staff felt that it's just appropriate to delineate it as it is, knowing that on Packer game day, it's already going to be a left only lane on that left side. So to make it consistent, both for regular everyday use and Packer game day, that, again, that's my assumption that that was the decision that was made. It's also consistent with other intersections that were changed over as a part of that analysis. So Argonne Street, uh, over by Brookwood, I believe, by the Cabela's entrance, that was also marked similarly to what Southbound Ridge has. So there was some consistency uh, with that regard. Uh, again, either option works from a traffic analysis standpoint. It's really just a matter of what is, uh, I guess, preferable by the board. Both will work. There is an expense, obviously, associated with reverting back. And as Tracy had mentioned, there's obviously a learning curve that's already started to develop. We would be creating that kind of chaos again, yep. at least in the short term, by reverting back again. And th those are kind of policy decisions that you as the elected body have to give us guidance on because well, let me, in let all me likelihood, you're getting the calls. Let me state it to you this way, Joel. Um, those markings right now are not helping at all. No. Because you know where how the people drive it? With one set of tires on in the right turn lane yep. and one set of tires over here. Yep. Did you have a picture of me doing that today? <laughs> I, I'm just I did saying it. I did it. that it doesn't work. I don't Agreed. care what the engineer said or what happened. I'm just saying that's what's happening. And there hasn't been a change in the people's pattern. They just go, oh, I'm not supposed to be over there. So they partially get over this way and go right straight through it anyhow. It, it just yep. doesn't work that way it doesn't a lot of people uh when this happened they approached me with why did the village mark the street to give the packers a left turn into lambeau yeah. field because there's nothing there to go into but lambeau field and and i agree there there's just it's a mess I, I for some one, reason argon does not because that's going into cabela right i do because and if you think if you if you're going down that street that's the way the people are mostly going. It makes sense. This one, people are going straight down yeah. Ridge. And I, I know it because I, I guarantee you, you could stand right there in Crow's parking lot and count the cars. 
Yep. And that's the way they're going through that intersection. They're trying to observe it, but they aren't getting all the way over it, right? Because they're they're going straight through. Right. I get it that it's cost more money. I get it was a mistake and it, it cost money the first time, but it's not being observed anyhow. Right. So it doesn't make sense I to agree. leave it that way. Yeah, I, th I think it feels different. The, they feel different when you drive them. When you drive the one on Ridge and Valley View, it feels like you have to change lanes to follow the signs mm -hmm. right now. When you're driving the one by Cabela's, it feels like you should be over to the right and just continue through um, because there's like a median or something in there that kind of pushes you that way anyway. But yeah, I've been at that intersection trying to pull onto a ridge from Valley View many, 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 many times. And it feels like those cars are gonna, you have to pull out so far to see past that fence. It feels like they're gonna smack right into you. If they could be over where they wanna be and only the people turning right would be, you know, shining their lights at you, I think that would be way better. Yeah, I agree. I drive that, that area right in front of Kroll's um, every day, and I agree with, with, with you that, um, Tracy, that um, it's getting better. People are getting used to it, or uh, uh, more aware it's there, whether to get used to it or not, because I'm still not used to it. I drive it every morning. <laughs> this is just not a natural thing. Um, it, it was a mistake to do. Um, I'd like to say let's give it more time. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've read, I just don't think it's gonna work. No. Now, this proposal here, does this revert back to what we had before? No. Uh, no, it, it's a little bit of a, I guess you'd consider it a, a combination of the two. So now we're gonna officially delineate the lanes, but the, I guess the prior typical motorist behavior is going to more likely match the delineation than what it's present. So the left lane will be straight through or left turn. The right lane will actually be a right turn only lane. On the Valley View. On to Valley View. Right. Okay. So previous to these uh, this delineation, there were no markings. There was no dedication right, right turn lane right. or right. Yeah, straight. That's, that's okay, the way that's the people right. drove yeah. it. Yep. Yep. That's I, the way they drove it. I'm just afraid with, yeah. like I said, my experience with it, I'm just not getting used to it that once we do get in, into the busy season here, warm weather, packer practices, training camp, everything, it's just going to get worse. Yeah. So, yeah. You it, know, was it was a mistake. It was a mistake. It was. It's a mistake. And if you don't make a mistake, that means you're not doing nothing. <laughs> so I think you've done something that, that educated us, and that's fine. We've made bigger mistakes than that, and uh, from I'm, I'm tired of getting calls about it, and it's still a joke to a lot of people. What did you do? I, you know, I, I don't have an answer to it other than it's a mistake. Uh, the the cost you, you you've added every breath you could in there for that cost to to generate that. You know, Brian, I'll get you a gallon of paint and a couple of sanding bars and, you know, for six pack of beer, we can have that fixed. You know, half the arrows are there to get it done. So get the darn thing done and let's just say a mistake we've learned by it. I think if the new option was already approved by a traffic engineer, we're okay there. There you go. And I think um, if that intersection is going to be controlled on game days by public safety, which it is, the fact that it's a combination through and left turn lane isn't even gonna matter. You're gonna have officers out there directing traffic anyway, so. It worked with nothing before. Right, yeah. So I'd we move screwed to- screwed up ourselves. I'd move to approve it. I'll second. We have a, don't we have a motion and a second, right? Oh, right. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, Can I mind. just make one other recommendation on it that we get the word out then if you're gonna do this? get the word out and put some additional signage up there saying there's a change up here because we're gonna get the same thing. You know you're gonna call us, I'm gonna get calls. Now what is this? People are gonna, some people are gonna hate it and they're gonna say this is really stupid. So you're gonna get the same thing, you guys. And if we could try to get the word out, let people know. And my question to the chief is, what do you think about all this? Has public safety weighed in? I think, I know in the internal meeting you guys have been involved, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, we, we did and we had a, a good discussion on this. Um, you know, but prior to uh, whenever this was implemented, unfortunately, I, I don't think I was even here at that time um, and when, the, when this occurred. So, you know, to me, uh, I'm in agreement that I think that it makes the most sense uh, to change it 
Um, so it's straight through um, on the closest lane to the to the middle. So that's straight through, and then it's a right turn only um, on Valley View. To us, that makes the most sense. Um, we also anticipate, you know, that vision triangle as well being an issue for people. We, you know, right now it's okay. Um, as motorists get, and, and the summer gets here and there's more and more traffic out there, I envision that could be a problem for us as well. Um, we certainly don't wanna be out there monitoring traffic all the time to make sure that they're following the current pattern because they're really not. So that's gonna take up a lot of time as well. I think that if we change it to the new proposed way, I think it'll be easier for everyone and that's, that's my opinion on that. Do you think as part of this, engineers, I guess, on public safety that we should look at that fence whether it's a right, was a right from the right, or it's, we change it or whatever, but and have that be part of it. Just say, you know, hey, this is an issue. It's a vision issue. It's in the vision triangle. Let's take care of it. I think there's a local resident in the area that definitely wants us to take a look at that fence issue. Not naming any names or pointing fingers at anyone, but uh, but certainly, I think the fence issue. We've discussed this internally too. That it's obviously within the vision triangle, so I think there's an opportunity for us to address that with that property owner. Um, we have to do a little bit of background research. We, our understanding is that there were, were prior conversations that sections of that fence needed to be removed to begin with. So we want to go back and verify that that is the case and and approach that property owner appropriately for that case. Um, but to also address the comment about communication, clearly we could have done a better job at communicating the change previously. We could have done a better job of delineating the lanes as far as putting the orange flags out for the change in traffic pattern. And um, my suggestion for staff would be let's make sure that we do that when we revert back to kind of that updated traffic pattern. It's flagged appropriately, it's signed appropriately, and then we'll work with uh, Haley and Communications and making sure that we get enough information out in our newsletter and online. Okay. Um, would, would you be welcome to adding to the agenda or to the motion um, getting that fence taken care of? I recommend. Recommend staff. that staff work on that and get that taken care of because it's an issue too. I don't think that fence is going to be a problem with that parking or that, that property owner. Uh, I think he just has to be approached on it and say, hey, look, you're, you're infringing on the right of way here and he'll take care of it. Uh, you know, I think we're going overboard on a subject that should have been approved and moved down about six spots already. Uh, so I don't see a problem there. I'll, I'll personally go over there and talk to him. Okay. You're going to move the fence? <laughs> Pardon? I'm sorry, what did you say? I, catch, I missed the end of that care. I what? I didn't get to. I'm sorry, I, didn't, I missed what you said right at the end I'll there. I'll personally go over there and talk to him. Okay, sounds good. Matter of fact, I'm due for a meeting with him anyway. There you Almost go. Almost every three month discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to approve, to go back, to change the lane delineation markings on Bridge and Valley View. Any other discussion? God, I hope not. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Nine I, early street easement release. Ryan Ricker. All right, I'll try to make this one short and sweet. <laughs> uh, um, so I was approached uh, middle of February about a 12 foot utility easement that was on the north side of parcel 79-1. Um, this parcel is essentially located in the northeast corner of Early Street and Collette Ave. Um, we do have on the south side of that parcel a 50 foot wide right of way. Um, we currently do have a stormwater pipe that's in that right of way. And if there is any future desire to extend our public right of way to the river, essentially we do have a 50 foot wide right of way in that portion. So essentially, this is just uh, releasing that, that utility easement, 12 foot utility easement on the north side of that property. Move to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second to approve the early street easement release. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. Thank you. 9J, grant Packerland roundabout intergovernmental agreement. Ooh. Brian Rickert. Ooh. All right, so at Packerland and Grant, uh, the county had applied for STP Urban Grant, uh, which is a 80%, 20% split, uh, with the federal government covering 80% of the project costs, uh, and the municipality, whether that be the county 
or the local municipalities covering the remaining 20% uh, of the construction costs. Um, so with that, you can see there, there is a split um, in this intergovernmental agreement that is attached to the memo. Uh, that split is only uh, between 80% being covered by state and federal funds, 20% being split in half, uh, halfway in between Ashwaubenon, the other half being Brown County. Um, which results in a expenditure of $48,000 in 2023, and then during construction, a $137 expense uh, in 2026 for the construction. Uh, the one thing that should be noted, this was brought to Public Works and Protection. Um, Public Works and Protection re recommended that uh, staff reaches out to the county and also the Village of Hobart and Town of Lawrence uh, as they're kind of team players adjacent to this roundabout where it would be installed. Uh, to see uh, what their responsibility would be and to have some responsibility uh, in this inter intergovernmental agreement which supports the construction of the roundabout. Any questions for Mr. Rickert? I, I don't understand why Brown County didn't include Lawrence and Hobart in that. I mean, it's... It should have been. It's all, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, we shouldn't have to pay for all of the 50% of the 20%, so. Did, did we reach out? What happened? Are they willing to yeah, take yeah. on yeah. part of it? There you go. Um, I have not reached out to Hobart or Lawrence. Um, that is something that I'll have that discussion based on whatever direction we get from Village Board tonight um, to see you know, what, the, what the next steps would be. It's kind of unique. I did include a map of how the municipal boundaries work. Um, it is kind of unique, kind of the bullseye center portion of that roundabout is in Ashwaubenon, but when you get to the western, southern um, legs of that roundabout, they are, they are in Hobart and Lawrence. So um, it is definitely, you know, something that will benefit uh, other municipalities aside from just Ashwaubenon. At Public Works, you had actual figures of what you thought each municipality should be responsible for, I remember. Right. Um, so. If you go by, if, if you just look at um, the actual, not, not the center part, but the actual adjacent properties around it, uh, Village of Hobart being approximately 50%, um, Lawrence being 25, and then Ashwaubenon being the remaining, remainder of the 25%. So this is 25% of the 20% that the municipality <laughs> is responsible for, right? It's it, not 25, 20% of the project. So, um, it would so essentially the Outagamie County is comfortable covering 50% of the 20%. That remaining 50% would then be split amongst the three municipalities. So, so it's 20% of the 50%. Yeah. So the, there's a grant that's covering 80% of the cost. Yeah. Right. 20% of the total project costs is borne by the local municipalities. So that dollar amount then is split 50/50 between the county and the local jurisdictions. Okay. Right now under the current agreement, we have 50% of that local share and our position that we're proposing to the board and for your consideration is that the village only covers, here's here to add more confusion, 50% of the 50%. There you go. And then 25% and 25% are covered by Hobart and Lawrence respectively. Has that been agreed upon yet? No. no, that no. we're we're looking for direction and, and a commitment from the board for us to approach the county that that's the direction you would like us to okay, take. Okay, so we're no different than we were with Public Works then. Right. No. Okay, so I'm going to make a motion a motion to deny this and go back to the surrounding municipalities for their input on splitting this equally. Would that be the county's responsibility, though? If we're saying we're we're part of this, we're not the whole responsibility. Would the count, Would we have to go back to the county and say, we believe Hobart and Lawrence should be involved and that would be their job to do that, not ours? Can yeah. we do a second here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think what Brian is trying to say is that we're just trying to give them a courtesy call that, hey, we're, our board has directed us to negotiate with the county yep. to identify Hobart and Lawrence as also partners in this project. So we're going to notify the county of that so when when you get a call from the county highway commissioner, you're not taken by surprise. Okay, but it's ultimately the county commissioner's job to he okay, have to need, revamp. Okay, we need a second on the motion oh, because sorry, Gary Mary, did make sorry. a. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to deny this intergovernmental agreement and go back to the county. Um, okay, further discussion. 
Um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. Um, so basically the county is gonna have to revise this agreement that we have sitting before us to include Lawrence and Hobart. And we're saying yes, indeed, we want mm -hmm. them to do that because they are also interested in municipalities is what we're saying. That's correct. Correct. Okay. Then the other thing I have I wanted to mention is um, I think it's great that the county got the STP grant. It's a, it, eighty percent of that project has been covered, and I congratulate them for doing that. And I would advise us to let them know that. Let maybe even reach out to Troy and say, "Hey, we're glad that you guys did this. It's reducing our costs. It's reducing your cost costs um, because this is a big project." And you know, Hobart and Lawrence getting involved too will reduce our costs. And I think it just needs to be, you know, really known to the county that we appreciate their help on this so we don't have any problems in the future with, you know. I have a meeting coming up with Troy. Yeah. Who's, who's gonna bear the uh, cost of maintaining it? And I can touch on that. So um, generally the way that it's set up through the highway maintenance manual, um, the pedestrian accommodations is usually there's a maintenance agreement that the pedestrian accommodations are maintained by the local municipality. The roadway itself um, and everything adjacent, you know, curb and gutter stuff like that would be the, be the county. So. And, and landscaping, yes, that's a good point, Aaron. I should have touched on that. Landscaping is uh, generally the local municipality. So the middle of the roundabout would be the local municipalities, which would be all three of us then? They'll Correct. Be, I'm assuming there'll have to be an agreement that who, who's going to yeah, who's going to take care of that. Correct. Yeah. Maybe we can have Steve come and ask DePier to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say we could ask DePier to help yeah. us out. Ten years later, we'll get it done. <laughs> Okay, so Gary made a motion to deny this intergovernmental agreement and to have staff go back to the county. Is that the motion that we should have? Okay. And I would ask staff, if Brian and I talked about this, but if we can get some conceptual design from the county in regard to bicycle and pedestrian accommodations out there because it is a federal STP grant and that's required of the grant and just to make sure that we're comfortable with it because our bike ped plan does call for a path, I believe, along the north side of Grant coming into this. So we want to make sure everything connects and we're okay with what is proposed for that. So if Brian could work on that as well. Yep, I can do that. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion and a second to deny and have us work with the county um, to get the other two municipalities on board. Any other comments, concerns? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried, thank you. 9K, review and action regarding the bid award for the village parking lot and sidewalk project. Brian Rickert. All right, so this is uh, essentially a project that we rebid out. Um, so it may seem somewhat familiar to you. Uh, we rebid this out, la or we bid this out originally last summer. Um, the bid was then rejected uh, because the prices that we saw were uh, far more inflated than what we considered to be acceptable. Um, so when we did bid it out, uh, we did it did result in a $388,000 savings. Um, we are looking to add a little bit uh, of addition to the project, kind of changing the scoping to add uh, new lighting uh, within the north parking lot near public safety. Um, some of it uh, is at the end of its useful life, does, does have some damage. Um, so we are looking to have it replaced to match the stuff that on the south side of the building. Um, with that, there was multiple different alternatives. Uh, those alternatives included um, fencing in uh, the public safety employee parking lot area, along with that uh, different uh, parking lots out at Cornerstone. Um, with that, we are recommending that we do select all, all the alternatives, um, which includes all the parking lots out at Cornerstone, the lighting on the north parking lot, the fencing around the north parking lot, um, is also part of the base bid uh, was for the installation of sidewalk on Bart Star and Brett Favre. So um, the lowest responsible bidder uh, was Northeast Asphalt uh, in the amount of 899,000. Any comments? Um, I had asked Brian about Brett Favre and with that new development going in there that if we could kind of hold off on that and he said they did, they are looking at waiting on that sidewalk to see when the development comes through so it's not put in and then ripped up again, depending on the timeline for that development. That, that's correct. Okay, anybody wanna make a motion? 
Uh, we, one other question. Why are we fencing in the parking lot? Chief, I don't know if you want to touch on that. I would. So one of the complaints that I received from officers was the security of our back parking lot. Um, recently, we've had, uh, I guess, less than desirables back there who have actually defecated on our officers' vehicles. Um, so we want to make sure that that parking lot is as secure as possible. So uh, we're trying to make sure that we maintain safety and security around the public safety building. And that'll be slotted, you said? At, as for how to get into the, the building? Fence still be slotted. Oh, slats in the fence? No. Oh, it's not. Mm -mm. Why did I think it was in here? Chain link fence and automatic gate. Oh, automatic gate. Okay, all right. Maybe I misread it. Okay, all right. Understandable. Okay. Anybody want to make a motion? I'll Move make a motion approval. to award the uh, uh, Northeast Asphalt uh, for the parking lot and sidewalk project contract, including alternatives one through six, an amount of $899,259.65. A second. We have a motion and a second to award the contract with all the stuff that Jay said, <laughs> <laughs> as presented in the green sheet. Any other comments, concerns, questions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 9L, action on the Village of Eshwabnan ordinance number 03-2-23, amending section 9-1-2, parent E, relating to the discharge of firearms within village limits. Mr. Legal. Uh, public safety brought this to my attention that actually there is no exception for um, discharging of any kind of firearms within the village um, other than a public safety officer. Uh, this doesn't count for any kind of parades or uh, funeral services or things of that nature. What this ordinance does is kind of um, imitate the exceptions for fireworks. There's fireworks have certain exceptions where you can, um, I guess, light them off in, in, uh, within the village for um, parades and, and other kind of services like that. So those exceptions are kind of just duplicated in this ordinance. Um, Essentially, what this does is allow for military services at funerals to do the um, the, the, the three fire volley or uh, at parades or th things like that without needing some kind of approval. Um, as of right now, there really is no basis for any kind of exception or approval. This ordinance would allow um, public safety uh, or the chief or the chief's de designee to approve some kind of um, maybe an exception could be provided. Um, it, it, in the event that calls for it. Other than that, the exceptions that wouldn't need approval are your typical public safety officer, um, funerals for military services, funerals or uh, military services at parades, um, track and field events, theatrical events, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, this was approved at committee. Can I ask a question? The, when they shoot the guns off at funerals and maybe in a parade or something, are those blanks or? Yeah, those are just blanks. Yeah. Okay, I have. It. Thank you. But the right, and that's what we looked into as well. But the blank is discharged by gunpowder, correct, Chief? So I think correct the, yeah. under the um, the firearm and uh, and the uh, firearm discharge definition of the ordinance, it is by gunpowder. So it would necessarily need to have that exception in there. Okay. I'll move to approve the adoption of Village Ordinance zero three dash two dash two three relating to the discharging of firearms within the village limits. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 03-2-23 relating to discharging of firearms within village limits. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 9M, action on Village of Ashwabnan ordinance number 03-1-23, an ordinance amending municipal code section 3-2-27 parent A relating to licensing procedures. Mr. Legal. Okay, so this ordinance um, is based on feedback that the staff has, re has received from the board relating to alcohol applicants. So when someone comes in for um, a class A and B, at class B, beer and liquor, so your typical bar license, um, 
if someone comes in for an application, the village staff doesn't necessarily have any authority to say that that can't be allowed. Instead, we, the village staff takes the applications and brings them to, and provides feedback if necessary, and brings them to the board. Traditionally, what the staff has seen and how the village has operated, it kind of has this policy where uh, licensed establishments that are granted liquor licenses, restaurants, grocery stores, things of that nature, um, that's the only thing that's, that's necessarily granted. So traditionally, the village is only granted that. The perfect example is the poorhouse that just came through just right now. Um, let's say the poorhouse had was just a bar. That's it. Um, it, it, it. Under this ordinance, it would be denied. I mean, the board could not approve it unless it had something else, like a restaurant. So the, the staff kind of has that direction going forward, saying that there, there is an ordinance on the books. It is law that if you apply for a liquor license, class B, like a bar license, you have to have something else a primary principal uh, business, and then the alcohol comes second. So the statute, the statutes of 125.32, subparagraph um, sub 3M, gives a list of what it is. Bowling alleys, movie theaters, grocery stores, um, I think a painting studio was in there, which is kind of unique. I don't know necessarily why a painting studio is in there. Anyways, a restaurant is, an, is the other one. Basically what this does is it takes the village policy that it's been operating on for how many years, and it brings it into um, a procedure, uh, uh, an ordinance, a law. It makes the village policy law, and it provides staff direction as to what we can tell the applicants that come in. If someone comes in again and say, I want to open a bar, the village can say, you can't have a bar because you have to have one of X number of things attached to your bar. If it's a grocery store, great. If it's a bowling alley, great. If it's a restaurant, great. Then we take that application, send it to the village board, saying we recommend based on this. Now, the, uh, the addition that was added is the restaurant. Um, in staff's opinion, the restaurant definition of the Wisconsin alcohol statute is somewhat vague. So technically, um, someone could come and say, well, I have a restaurant. I have pizzas. That could be, by definition, a restaurant under the state statutes. This, de uh, excuse me, this restaurant definition kind of bolsters it and strengthens what I think the board would approve if someone brought forward a full service restaurant, so to speak. I have full menu. Um, I have the appropriate staff needed to run this restaurant. I have uh, a kitchen, cooks, etc. That kind of um, information where you're running a full service restaurant. This also is combined with a restaurant being um, needing 50% or more sales. It's not an arbitrary number. It is uh, found under the uh, Class C wine license. So if someone wants to have a wine bar, you also have to have a food that has more than 50% of your overall sales. That's kind of where this number is coming from. Um, essentially, it just strengthens the restaurant definition to show that this is a full service restaurant. So again, what this does is take the village's policy of having something else needed with your bar application, so to speak, and it, and it formalizes it. And, uh, and that's where, uh, what, what would become a law at this point. So um, this was denied. I know they're uh, at committee. I know there's concerns about the 50% threshold. Uh, and we certainly have alternative ideas we can add in. Um, so the board has a couple options. It can certainly approve as is or approve with corrections. Could certainly deny or revert back um, to the table, uh, or could revert back to a committee for staff to explore more options or to further explain. Um, I realize that uh, in trying to explain this, <laughs> might be seem a little confusing. Uh, certainly how to apply this in kind of a real world a uh, application. Um, so I'm happy to give the kind of examples of what it could show or how this could mean in, um, in the real world and how someone could, how this could affect someone. And if uh, not explaining anything is more detailed, I'm more than happy to provide any, uh, answer any questions. To Just simplify this, if this was in ordinance, the way you have it, that would save half the problems we had with the poor folks. Basically, yes. Mm -hmm. We could still give guidance as to what it is, yeah. but right, we would tell Tyler and It April would be Smith, more yes. specific to Correct. him mm -hmm. to know what he's up against yes. right from the get-go. Right. Okay. 
But in a case just like like his, like the poor house, you know, just looking at the menu, I was satisfied with that. But are you going to go into his establishment on a given time and say, let's see your sales receipts? Uh, you have not hit the 50% threshold, therefore we're pulling your license. Is that what happens? Yeah, if there's complaints with that, um, that's what the that's a mess. yeah the village would have to work with state agents and certainly um, other uh, you know, village staff to, to kind of determine what this receipts are. Uh, Department of Revenue being number being one of them. If there are blatantly obvious violations of that, I think that's grounds for that that person is not operating how their license is. So let's say that all right, we have a full service restaurant. This applicant does. And um, six months from now, we, we find out that there's absolutely no food being served. I think that's one of the more obvious reasons. But, um, but yeah, that's, it's a valid concern where it's, all right, where, how do we meet that 50% threshold? I think that the village staff would only look into and really kind of dive deep into the, those kind of taxes and the sales receipts if there are some legitimate concerns that they're so blatantly uh, violating this. So that's just one more thing Gary's got to do then. Uh, Gary would take the lead, <laughs> yes. Okay. Like that. Cool. cool. <laughs> Yeah, my whole issue, and I know that I brought this up when we were at Public Works, I struggle with the 50%. I would like to see terminology put in here, uh, maybe defining a full service restaurant a little bit more, but not 50% of sales, because I really struggle with looking at an Anduzzi's and a Stadium View and saying that 50% of their sales is food. I really struggle with that, and I have a hard time passing this knowing we already have establishments that I don't think can live up to this. Burkles. Burkles. D2. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you throw in doing 50 percent. When you throw in 10 weeks of Packer home yeah. games, yeah. Sure. they're not right. doing 50. And, and that's just yeah. skewing the whole. Exactly. That's cer certainly fair. And, and part of the definition was just kind of show applicants who come in and show the board that the primary business has to be a restaurant. Yeah. That's pretty much what I, I think it's is. a great idea because uh, you know, sitting on the public works board, Gary, and, and when we get this all the time, and we got to explain that every time, you know, you don't have the restaurant and you don't. So I think it'd be great to allow staff to be able to upfront say, hey, guess what? You need to have these requirements. Um, I would like to see this go back and have uh, staff rework this to remove the 50% sales and to give a little more definition to what a full service restaurant is because I still think that's appropriate and I think it'll also help and I think it would have helped the case that we uh, reviewed earlier but I don't think 50% is the, is the uh, percentage is the right way to go. I get it's in the state statutes with the wine thing but I, I just don't see it that fits us. Is that state statute with the wine or is that it is. ours? Yeah. It is state it, So this restaurant is kind of merged of a couple different restaurants within this restaurant definition of the statutes, the 50% comes from the wine license. Okay. Um, and, and one more thing I forgot to mention, mention just keep in mind that um, the principal business has to be that other thing attached to the bar, right? So if that other thing, grocery store, uh, what is it? Bowling, Bowling alley, right, thank you, uh, at, at restaurant, if they're not operating that principal business, that is grounds to revoke the license. Someone comes in and says, I have a bowling alley, I want my, can I have a, the, the license, please. Well, the board could grant the license, and we find out there's no pins or lanes or whatever. That's certainly grounds to not operating their principal business. So, again, principal business, that's the primary. The alcohol is secondary under this ordinance. What about the lady that just opened up the, uh, the, the yeah. painting shop? I mean, now she's got to serve 50% food in her place no, now? She has no, beer. which is... She you, just says, okay, she that's, 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 okay yeah. not for her license. So... Okay. One thing about that, and I mentioned painting studio, and that certainly might could be restricted because, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you can't have a class B liquor in a painting studio, I, I believe. Anyways. Well, you know, you learn something new every day, and that was my, my you know, understanding of it. When I talked to um, the agent from the Department of Revenue, they are quoting another statute that said if you are allowed, if, you, if you're allowed to get a class B beer, then you can get a class B liquor. I've never seen that happen in all the years that I've worked with liquor licenses. So um, they can. Okay. 
I mean, I think I, I even showed you that. Right. Yeah. We, Chris yeah. and I did some research on that, and um, maybe more to come. But yeah. you know, at the same time, if the board doesn't feel it's appropriate to have a painting studio with a liquor license, the board doesn't have to grant that. It's just there's there's some disqualifiers on there already. Um, so it, it, it's certainly within the board discretion. Now, again, staff isn't going to look at this and say, uh, say, look at the applicant and say that this is, it's close, so, but we're not going to grant it. The discretion certainly lies within the board. If there's something that we believe might be a full service restaurant or not, the board can make the decision. And if we think it's full service restaurant and we come with, and we recommend approval, the board might think it's not. So again, it's not that the staff is bringing these applications forward and saying, please grant this. It's just knowing that um, the staff will likely approve um, based on the, the ordinance. So this discretion to grant or deny still remains within the board. But if I could, I voted against this on public works because I like it. I like the board to have more discretion to grant liquor licenses, even just to a true tavern. I know historically in Ashbabanon, there has been a requirement that there be a restaurant or a bowling alley or whatever with it, but what if the perfect opportunity for a, an amazing tavern comes to us? If we have this ordinance, we can't say yes. And I know historically they didn't want just true taverns in Ashwabanon because they didn't want it to turn into another Broadway district, but and we don't even have one. I mean, if it got to the point where we have one or maybe two true taverns, we could do this ordinance then and stop it at two or stop it at one. I mean, we don't have any. If we enact this, we can't ever have just a true tavern in Ashwaubenon. I would rather just leave it the way it is, and we can, on a case-by-case -case basis, approve or deny the license request. It did cost those people three swings at the cat, but um, that's unusual. I mean, usually if the staff says when they're applying, typically this group only applies it if you have 50% restaurant or whatever, then they'll do that. But, you know, there might be, I don't, I don't even know an example of a, just a true tavern that I think we would accept, but I feel like we're just basically, if we enact this saying, we're never gonna have just a tavern in Ashwaubenon. Then maybe that's what the group wants, but I, I would vote no. So my, con my concern, with, so years ago, we, we only granted liquor license if there was food involved, a, a restaurant, not a pizza oven, or you know, hot dogs on a, a hot plate. Um, I guess my concern with with what you just said, Kelly, is that if we go that route, we have an entertainment district down here. We could we could run into some problems. Um, Couldn't we just enact the the ordinance? You know, if we get one in and it's a problem, then we then we enact this. We have it all drafted. And then there would never be another one. No. So what, but what then you have the problem one. So I, what I you're saying, like Kelly, is one, is yeah. just basically leave it the way it is, and we at the Public Works are just going to continue to monitor it and only allow in what we feel is necessary, and it's going to come to the board. So it all in an effect it does if we don't do this ordinance. <clears throat> Staff, I get it helps you guys to be able to stop some people and give better direction, but it just costs yeah, us time yeah. at the board level, is what it does, if, if I'm understanding it. Or Chris, is this causing you, If it, would this ordinance help you a lot? I guess my concern is when you really dig into statutes, um, you know, everything is so tight with the quotas here. Mm -hmm. And when you read statutes, it talks about economic impact Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that. So, you know, since I've been here, we had a place that wanted to have a, a two seat bar. Are you going to give a class B combination that's um, a reserve, you know, $10,000 to that two seat bar versus, say, something in the entertainment district that would handle a thousand people? You know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's it's about economic impact and you can't pick and choose. You know, you, you, if, if you're gonna give it to, if you're gonna say, okay, we're gonna do it and that two seat bar comes first, they get it. You can't mm -hmm. say no. So I think you have to be careful. Can't we say mm -hmm. no based on economic impact? Pardon me? 
Can well, we say no based on economic impact? Like we don't. Well, you're kind of walking a fine line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. It's kind of what the what the board is doing now. <laughs> it, it, in, in a mm -hmm. sense, right? Mm -hmm. It's um, you know, I don't want to say the, board, the board's walking a fine line, right? Because the liquor license is uh, is a privilege, and the board has wide discretion to grant it or not. Um, right? There's no statutorily statutory or constitutional right to a, to a liquor license. Um, so this economic impact, right, the board is vetting the applicants and saying, well, how's your restaurant? And that's what it's been granting. However, if there is a, so to speak, nice tavern or a bar that comes forward in the future um, and it's granted, the it would be hard pressed to rely on that economic impact, um, uh, I guess, I guess theory <coughs> or, or reasoning in the future if a tavern, traditional tavern is granted a license. Hmm. So no, I mean, with that being said, keep in mind, we only do have two reserves left. Um, well, as of right now, I'll say that. But it, it is an efficient system for, uh, or efficient ordinance for the for the staff. I'll, I'll, I will mention that as well, but. Um, how much How much do they cost, these licenses? $10,000. A year? Uh, no, total. Just the plus, plus the license. Right, yeah. right, plus the additional fees, the license, um, and that's not the, is it thirty thousand for the title town district? Twenty. Twenty thousand. Twenty. So, so and, and just factors. to be clear, ten thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars for a reserve class B license, not a regular, but a reserve right. license. We do have regular licenses that, from time to time, may become available depending on if an operator ceases or relinquishes their license. Those do not bear that ten or twenty thousand dollar fee, oh. and that's a one-time fee at the point of application. And then you have your licensing fees, as, as Chris was saying, the, those are annual. So those are based on that annual licensing period. And that's a few, what, few hundred dollars for, I don't know, the, the license, the annual licensing fees for a combination license is what, Chris, do you know? It's 100 for beer, 500 for liquor. Okay. So five, let's say on a bar, they would have a combination, products. right? They would have a couple hundred, few hundred dollars in annual fees. But that ten thousand or that twenty thousand dollar fee is one time at the point of application. I'm just thinking a two seat bar isn't going to pay twenty thousand dollars for a license. You know what I mean? Never know. Maybe. You know the thing I think with all of this, um, I had talked to Patrick about this. Um, as I was looking through, through this, I was getting kind of more and more confused about what Patrick was trying to say and what we were trying to do with the ordinance and what we were talking about. And my suggestion was that this goes back to public works. And between Patrick and Chris and me, they put a nice informational presentation together. Because it sounds like we have a lot of different comments and concerns out there. And so at least we all understand, because there's reserve license, there's the exempt ones, there's the regular ones. There's a lot to this. And I think if maybe if we understand it a little bit better, then we'll feel more comfortable as we move forward. And then you have the whole, philosophically, what does the village want? Do we want bars? Do we want the environment? Don't we want bars? You know, and that's a whole philosophical thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think it's a big, it's a big decision, and we need to take our time and be informed to make that decision. So that would be my suggestion. We send back to Public Works. We have a, a really nice informational presentation done for them and maybe the Village Board as well, and and see where we're at. You know, there's just there's a lot to this. Liquor licensing is complicated it is it's very complicated. very complicated is that a motion Tracy I would make a motion to have Patrick and Chris prepare a informational presentation to go back to Public Works and then also come to Village Board and kind of you know give us more information on this so we can make a good informed decision Patrick, sure if, um, before you have a second, second I need a second okay. you need a second go on. second you have a motion and a second to send this item back to Committee. Okay, Patrick. Patrick, how much more can we beat this subject up? It's been through the channels already. What are we going to come up with that's going to be any different? Um, some ideas in mind that I've received from board direction right now is just kind of give a general um, guidance and advisement and a kind of a presentation how this is going to play in real in real life. Yeah. Um, if someone came in for some kind of like some kind of a, a license application, how would it apply? That's I, the feedback I'm getting. Getting it's a thorough explanation. What would happen? 
when this happens. Give examples, give hypotheticals. Certainly can do that. Um, the other thing I would discuss or tweak that staff would look at is the 50% sales. Yeah. Bolster that a little bit to talk about what a full service restaurant is right. rather than coming in and the, the having the concerns um, of uh, how are we checking to verify this is 50% sales. Um, again, that would go back in some blatant, obvious violation, but um, if there are certainly concerns about this 50% rule there's certainly alternatives that can be done is I, what why can't services. we just change that wording from 50 percent to a a restaurant definitely and a word that would say has to be the majority i don't want to use the word 50 percent <coughs> predominant More sales than beer sales sure. uh, liquor sales you know I, i'm going to go back to Broadly. I think the word that you're looking for, Gary, might be significant. Significant like like amount it. of their yeah, revenues are from other than than alcoholic alcohol sales. Alcohol sales. I think you're going to have to define significant, though, because if somebody <laughs> files a complaint, how do you how do you evaluate the complaint? And I, I, I don't disagree with you. And Kelly, I don't think but, we should have the rule if we're not going to enforce it. But I think any word, any word you're going to lose, oh, excuse, I hate to run over, but any word you're going to lose, they're going to come in and, and challenge it anyway. Uh, you know, it, if you had my opinion, to leave it alone like it is, because anybody that came into a Schwaben, and except to the poor house, and they did come up to our standards, it worked well all these years. You come to a Schwaben, you expect to have a restaurant. Like Jay says, uh, you're selling more alcohol than you are food. There's no doubt about it, especially on event days. <clears throat> Broadway has changed is what I'm trying to get to. That used to be bar after bar after bar. It is not that way anymore. They've eliminated a lot of the uh, bars down there, and the ones that are there went to food. They are serving food. If you want a good sandwich, there's a number of places on Broadway that does that now. I think there's more food outlets on Broadway than there are bars now. Sounds like you got a favorite, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I used to. <laughs> Just so you know, in my, my experience, I've already had someone say a vending machine is a restaurant. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, and and that's why I'm stating we need some. We definitely and and I I appreciate what Kelly's saying too. You got to yeah. have some definition that's firm and can be enforceable. I mean, it's right. it's a challenge, and, and that's why you you train lawyers to do that. <laughs> yeah, although if I could just add quick, it sounds like Gary has an, an interest in making a determination tonight, but what I'm hearing from the, the, the remainder of the board, however, that there's not a defined consensus as to what this is. There is a motion on the floor to send it back to committee. We can certainly work through that avenue, work to re, redefine or refine the definition of a restaurant. We understand, I believe anyway, that there is a, a uh, an interest by the board to eliminate specific percentage conditions in that paragraph. We can work to eliminate that. Uh, and then as far as staff goes uh, between Chris Patrick, myself, whomever, we can kind of work together in putting together a presentation on, on licensing too a little bit. So you have an understanding of regular versus reserve versus yeah. class so. B, class B, <laughs> class B combo. Yeah. Um, we can certainly touch on some of those exemption or exception yeah. components within the statutes as well and kind of run through at least at the committee level. And then if the, if the board desires to have that presentation, obviously it's done at committee. Uh, you can see it there. And then the final action on a possible ordinance change could be done at the next board meeting then. I, um, I know we're beating this to death, <laughs> but um, I would be, I think, satisfied uh, with possibly uh, full service restaurant and then define full service. Mm -hmm. yeah. That way you're yeah. not, you know, 50% mm -hmm. food. You're, you're defining you equipment, go. menu, uh, fully staffed, uh, dishwasher, whatever, whatever you want to put in there. And it's easy to walk in and see if it's and operational. 
if it's being operated during open open hours. And it's easy enough to walk in and just look and look, and the lights on. Well, they're not operating it. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Well, that's what we beat Toro so far. Yeah. Yeah, they defined and they did. So. I think defining that is going to be difficult based on equipment because equipment demands have changed. Yeah. People are specifically trying to get away from having hoods because they're so expensive. They have to be clean. You have to have your Hansel system checked. It's costly. Well, so, it's not going to be easy. No. I it's, mean, it's... Defining that based on equipment, I mean, I don't know what you would use besides the dishwasher. But that's just part you know, of the... Right. It's just a piece of it. Mm -hmm. We, we, we don't necessarily have to be define the type of equipment. Right. I definitely think we're onto the right Fully track. equipped, fully referred, whatever you right. want, whatever word you want yeah. to use. You know, full service restaurant, then define. Full and then food. define it from there. Okay, so on the floor we have a motion to send it back to committee. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's vote on that motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. One, uh, no. Okay, thank you. 9N, action on Village of Ashwaubenon Ordinance 03-3-23, amending Municipal Code 14-1-6, parent B, parent 1, relating to official floodplain maps. I have been waiting all night for this, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I make a motion to approve? You I certainly can. That. <laughs> second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance number 03-3-23. Any comments, concerns? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Nice job. Aaron, Aaron's <laughs> voice is going to be strained, so I didn't want that. So. 9-0, consider discuss act on annual update to the village of Ashwabnan five-year strategic plan. Joel. So I know how everyone is excited to see my 90-minute presentation on this matter. I'm going to refrain from doing that given the nature of time. However, I did want to provide to you an update with oh, where staff are at <laughs> with action items in our strategic plan. So for the sake of time and for ease, um, wanted to see if the board had any questions with the information that was presented. If the board would like, we can prepare a presentation to kind of walk through it in a little bit more detail in a more uh, schnazzy um, uh, <coughs> environment. But uh, if you do have any questions or comments or feedback on our status and work to date, I'm certainly um, um, able to take that feedback. Or if you simply have items that you think should be included, uh, we would typically like to do this annually where we bring an update, a status update on our action items, and if there are any changes, modifications, or additions, we can entertain those as well. So I'll leave it at that. If there's any comments, feedback, questions, um, or additions, we'd be welcome to, to take those into consideration. A request I would have, Joel, is because of, of the difficulty with getting this information within our current system that we get it, if you could just highlight changes that have been made and get those out to us, maybe via email or something, it's just too difficult. Uh, to, I, couldn't, I couldn't sort through it and figure out, okay, this changed or that changed. I really couldn't find what changed. So I, sure. I would appreciate just finding change. I'm sure it's not wholesale changes, and I'd just like to yep. get a highlight of those, that's yeah, all. Definitely no changes to any of the action items. It was just updates, status updates on where we're at to date in completing the, the action items if they were um, a tangible time constrained item. Yep. If it's an ongoing item, obviously we're, we're just doing it. Right. Yeah. But I can certainly send that out as a separate attachment as well so that you can, or I could have a printed copy yeah, of that. If we could just get to highlight it, okay, here's, here's the stuff we changed. Yep. Boom, boom. Joel, is, it hasn't been five years no. since we've been through this. We we used to have Last these year. meetings over at the community center putting this together. That is correct. So what we look at is the duration of five years from the start of plan through implementation. So when five years is up, then the anticipation is if the board desires, we would go through a process again of developing a new set of objectives and action items. So we're just, we're basically in year two of a five-year plan. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, no, I, I think it's good to be uh, informed on it, but uh, I know the subject's brought up periodically when I talk to a few people about it. And yes, we do have one, so. Okay, 
Sounds good. Okay. Do we, do we need a motion? motion? No action is necessary okay. unless you feel like there's a need to, to make any corrections, additions, or changes. No. Okay. Okay, thank you. Number 10, items for next agenda. I don't, you know, our public works is next Wednesday, is it not? Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're gonna have time to get this liquor license issue, the ordinance. Um, next Wednesday, yeah. Done, so that won't probably be on the next agenda. But anyway, if there's anything anybody would like to see on an agenda, call the staff. Okay, closed session items. During the meeting of the Village Board of the Village of Ashwabnan, may convene into closed session pursuant to A and B in number 11. As presented, the Village Board may thereafter reconvene in open session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 19.85, Parent 2 to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. I need a motion to go into closed session. Hello. Second. Motion and a second to go into closed session. Roll call, please. President Kardoski. Yes. Trustee Paul. Yep. Trustee Atkinson. Yep. Trustee Zerbel. Yes. Trustee Service. Yes. Trustee Krieger. Yes. And Trustee Fluke. Yes. We're in closed session. This conference is no longer being recorded. I'll ask that uh, I change the order of those because I'm assuming you're going to. Yeah, I was just going to ask him. I kicked out again. Yeah. If we change the order. I feel like there's no financial gain for this one. I know that. Did you really have to shoot? It's just those you just got to kind of. Yeah. Here, I'm going to get more. Yeah, I'm going to sit down. 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 I'm going to sit down